viable commercially, which is not worthy of release. Nobody would want to actually see those. People want entertainment. People want sort of popular song and dance. And yet, all these people are actually living over, uh, you know, two people whose loved ones are actually in coma and they're uncertain whether they would come out or not. Very grim in terms of the subject. And yet, the kind of treatment that the story... You have Sanyukta Chavla, who started with... She wrote in... Uh, no, she didn't have uh, the uh, woman from a Muslim family, a conservative Muslim family, whose interest is to be a jasus, a detective. I mean, extremely unusual, feel very apprehensive about. It made its mark, it had a major star playing in that, and it connected with the popular audience. Cut to Alankrita. She made a lipstick under my burqa, which has been making waves to in virtually every festival that it goes to. And when I say making waves, I mean... What are your considerations? So I think that um, I speak for myself, but perhaps I speak for a lot of um, other um, writers and directors. I think very often when we are just thinking of a story, um, sometimes you feel like before you can even flesh it out, you feel like, oh no, this is India and um, you know we can't uh, make this film. But I feel on the other hand, there's also that feeling that um, this is a story I want to tell and uh, I must tell it um, somehow, like in some way or the other. And I feel uh, personally I've been very uh, fortunate because I actually found uh, support for the films and I was able to make them. But even now I feel like I have one script which I feel I've not even shown to anybody because I'm like there is no way um, it will get passed. So I feel I think we kind of keep oscillating between feeling like this is a story I want to tell and uh, let me just tell it. So for instance, with the lipstick under my burqa, I think I really wasn't expecting that there would be any uh, kind of uh, any kind of opposition. I was just making a film about four ordinary women, you know, who are trying to secretly live out their small little dreams. And um, I never expected this kind of backlash. So I feel also what's strange is that you don't even know, like you, uh, you know, where that backlash will uh, come from and where you'll be stopped um, in your tracks. But I still feel that no matter what happens, it's very important for us as uh, writers and directors to really, um, and as producers, to support that kind of cinema. But I mean, I feel it's very important for us to courageously continue because otherwise I feel there's no hope. That's true. But tell me also, I want us to revisit where your sense of confidence comes from and you're taking up a theme like that, that there are these secret fantasies or secret dreams of four women okay, living in different strata of society and the film is essentially going to be about them. A theme sort of links all of them together. What gives you the confidence that actually people might want to watch this film? It's very unusual. I mean, if you told it to me as a con at a concept stage, I might have a question, I don't know, would people really be interested in this? What gives you the confidence that they will be? I don't know, maybe I'm going to answer not in a very correct manner, but uh, personally, I feel that, um, uh, I don't know, maybe other people are like, you know, they're more equipped to like figure out what uh, the audience will really want. I feel the only way I can judge something is I, if I feel like there's some honesty in it and it's coming from some truth of my own life. And uh, because I feel, especially because I'm more of an independent filmmaker, um, I feel that the only thing that I feel I have to fall back on is that it's an honest telling um, of the story. And there's some sort of truth that one is exploring. And I feel if that honesty is there, uh, it is certain that people will connect. I really feel like that. If, if I can answer that question, please, actually. Please, uh, I think anyway, good for you. We're all very proud of you, Alankrita, truly. Okay, and you hang in there and we're all with you here. Sayukta, what is it that actually you believe, which are again, okay, from another point of view, are you tempted to self censor Well, are you going to after the lipsticks experience? No. Whoa. Because um, I feel, if anything, um, when I started making uh, lipstick on my burqa, like I was saying, I was just making a film about four ordinary women and their small little secret dreams. After this CBFC uh, decision to refuse certification, I think it's made one thing very clear to me that now more than ever, I cannot like backtrack on my path 
and um, I'm very determined to continue making the films that I believe in, no matter what it takes and however difficult it is, because uh, I feel if because I feel like this entire uh, certification issue is far beyond them not certifying one film. Um, I feel that it's really about them silencing particularly the voices of women. And I feel that at this point in time, um, if I lose courage and hope, it would really like, it, I feel like it, I, I just can't do that. And so I'm very, very clear that no matter what happens, now more than ever, I'm determined to continue making stuff which I believe in. It doesn't have to be obviously that it's, I mean, it's just genuinely what I believe in. And I feel those are the kind of films I've made anyway. And uh, I feel particularly because the CBFC has tried to clamp down upon me like that, I'm determined to um, ensure that their purpose in terms of trying to silence uh, women's voices is not going to be served. I'm really clear about it and I feel that this is 2017. If we don't speak up and if we don't take a stand now, we really are sort of giving in and I think that's the death of creativity and of artists in this country. So I feel that now more than ever, it's very, very crucial for us to really continue on our path undeterred and uh, I don't care what happens. And I'm very, very clear that I will continue. I feel that um, though one can just only point fingers at the CBFC and be like, I don't feel that they're the only villains in the game. I feel as part of the larger amorphous film industry, we're all complicit in perpetuating uh, a scenario where often there's uh, the same kind of content that gets more prominence certain kind of films that really do not get support from studios and uh, so much fear because everybody is like so uh, concerned with commerce and also I feel it's not just one thing it's like a systemic thing because I feel it's exhibitors distributors I mean I feel at every level we need like this opening up of the mindset it's not only the CBFC so I feel that's of course like a major roadblock but I feel like actually for us to have um, as a country which promises freedom and gender equality, etc. I feel in the year 2017, we should be working towards a really healthy popular culture which actually has space for all kinds of content. And honestly, I feel that it's not just about the CBFC changing. I feel the audiences need to be more open. Uh, studios definitely need to be much more supportive of alternative content. Writers need to stop self-censoring. Everyone needs to have little more courage, little more patience. So I feel that if we really want uh, our country to have a really thriving cinema, one that is actually like what Ruja said, where all kinds of voices are there, I think each one of us has to take responsibility. And I feel it's not just about blaming the government and the system, but I feel as artists, as filmmakers, as producers, we all have, you know, this popular culture is a reflection of all of us. And even as the audience, I feel we can keep complaining and saying, oh, we don't have enough great films or whatever. But then we have to choose, uh, are we, you know, are we spending money on films that are perhaps more interesting? So I feel maybe like uh, overall some sort of serious self-reflection is required in all parties concerned in terms of what, what uh, is the culture that we are creating and what is the culture that we are really engaging in also. That's what I feel. True. Anything else? I think that, I think More books. Yes. That's all. We've all grown <coughs> up reading. Yeah. Yes. Can we move on? Yeah. Right. Yes, feel us, um, I feel I only want to, I'm only driven by the story that I want to tell. And I feel like we all, I think, spoke about this element of truth and honesty. I feel that when one is, I mean, that's my personal um, experience and opinion, uh, but I feel that one, when, is, when one is uh, sort of writing or directing a film uh, with honesty, one's politics anyway colors the work. And I don't, have never felt that uh, I have to now make a film which, you know, is some sort of crusade. Um, I guess the, the subversion just comes in into 
the work because of who I am and what I believe in. And yeah, that's. I think none of us can be apolitical anymore, right? Given the times we're living in. So if you're writing a story. It's not about anymore. Why are you? Um, talking about scared. I think I'm going to start with that. This is a scary combination. I've never seen something like this. Both of you national award winners for your work and for yours with Miss Namli, with John and Jane. Uh, I think it's a beautiful mix and the work shows of how you guys have come together from two different streams of this cinema. And I think I'd love to know the genesis of this entire process of how you guys came up with the project and what the whole story is. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's been quite a long journey, actually. Uh, Oshin, I only knew uh, when we started doing some promotions together. Um, and uh, so I saw him in a very glamorous, you know, um, way of uh, very stylized, very glamorous. But when we started chatting while making those commercials, I realized that there was a lot more uh, to Oshin. I saw his film, Miss Lovely. And, uh, I was very impressed with you know, the way he kind of takes his shots and the kind of eye, uh, eye he has for all the detailing and uh, the art, the production design, you know, everything that goes into it. And at that time I was offered this movie where these other producers had come to me and they said that uh, we want to have got the rights to make the film on Arun Gauli and we'd like you to play Arun Gauli and I was like, why guys crazy? From what angle do I look like Arun Gauli? And, um, but I said, okay, you know, it's interesting. And I started reading about Arun Gauli. I didn't know much about him. And I found him quite fascinating as a character. But I hated the script. But I really hated the script that those guys had given me because it had nothing to do with his life. It was just, you know, a commercial, hot boiler, you know, kind of unrealistic film that they wanted to do. And I said, if you're making a biopic, then it has to be a good one. And nothing came out of it. And uh, I had discussed this with Osho a long time ago. And then one day I just locked myself in a hotel room and I started writing down. I got quite obsessed with it and I started writing down, you know, a story which I sent to Osho just to get his feedback on it. And he loved it. And I'm glad he did because he doesn't like things very easily. And, uh, and, uh, and then, um, he said, okay, we're going to sit together, uh, you know, because if we make your film, the way you've written it, we'll be doing it in two parts. So we've got to make one film. And uh, then we sat down and started working on a structure. And all the producers who were with us started running away. And we were left with Oshin and a whole pile of team, who, uh, a team that we had hired, who we had committed to that we were going to make this film. And we also realized that we did, those producers did not have the rights to make the film. And then we had to go and acquire those rights. And from that, I think our journey began. And I think through that, we got to know each other. And, got to, and we decided what kind of film we really do want to make, you know, and what kind of scale do we want to make this film at, you know, and what kind of funding would be required to do it. And uh, we do not want to compromise on just anything and everything by a studio telling you to put it in an item number where it is not required. You know, and stay as true to uh, the story that we want to tell, which was not to glamorize or de-glamorize, but to let the audience make an opinion about the character we're talking about. Yeah, I think that's more or less the way things came about. It was quite bad. it was quite accidental, and I think the accidentalness of it. I mean, I, maybe neither of us thought about it that much. Beyond the point, and I think. Once we started working, we discovered that there was a chemistry because, you know, I am particularly, you know, I've come from a particularly anti-industry stance. Arjun comes from a very different space. But I think we had a lot of respect for each other's uh, understanding of the subject matter. I think one of the things that I said to him off is that I don't want to make a typical film. And he said to me, I don't want to make a typical film. So I think we were already on the same page when we started the, the project. And I said, I don't want to do a, like a hero kind of thing and you know, and, and I don't want to make a Bollywood gangster movie. I want to get into the period. I want to get into the atmosphere. I want to do it in a way where it's never been done before, you know, and it's a risk. It's a big film. Um, 
you know, there are always typical ways of making a gangster movie. This one doesn't do any of that. I mean, I'm talking even internationally, the way you light the gangster, it's like a top light kind of shot. There's a certain way. I've avoided all top light in this film. There's no top light. You know, there's none of that classic Marlon Brando kind of lighting. So just the whole approach of the film is very different. And I have to say that I never expected him to come with me all the way, and I, I really, he really did. So I, I, you know, I think that's the best kind of collaboration there can be when you, you actually work. And I think one of the biggest things for me was the fact that he had already engaged the writing. He had already engaged the process of thinking about Gauli as a character before I came on. So when I came on, I already knew that this guy's in it. It's not like, it's not like just an ego project. He was already committed to the idea of who this character is, how he sits, how he, he you know, and I, I, that kind of commitment I didn't expect. And I, it, it's really rare. And for me, then, when you see that, you want to work with somebody like that, I think. That's great. Uh, I mean, I didn't know you wrote this, so, I mean, it, the teaser looks like there's a lot of research that's gone in every detail, but when you started researching, what were basically the avenues for you to research this character who's very much alive? I mean, it's the time of biopics, whether it's Dhoni or Nirja, but this is very different, and if I hear, this is not a biopic and not a gangster film, but it's something in between. It's, it's a story. How did that process Cool. Yeah, so the research, research was a lot and uh, the, and if I talk too much about it, most probably I'll end up in jail, so I shouldn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you have to go, you have to go to where this world is, you know, you have to go and you have to find the people who belong to this world and, uh, you know, talk to them. That's what we did. Um, and of course, you had to get uh, the, the rights and the permissions from the family. You know, also um, making it clear to the family that this is not uh, uh, something which is just going to be a film to, uh, which is going to, you know, be uh, a propaganda around the character, you know, where you're just going to be showing him as this good guy or, you know, uh, doing a different kind of an image for him. It's not an image building exercise. We are excited because of the story, uh, because of the life he led, and that's what we want to really explore. And it took a lot of time to convince the family to do that. And um, fortunately, they came on board, they totally understood. And when uh, Arun Gavli came out on parole and we got, had the opportunity to meet him, he really said, no, I don't want to be shown as a hero. You know, I tell my story the way it is. Because this is the story of most of the people who come from our country, you know, who could go on whatever levels that they go to, you know, just to survive. And uh, when you want to change and you want to bring about a change within yourself, do the systems really allow you to do that or not? And that's exactly what we wanted to capture through the film. And I think we did so by making it not a documentary. And of course, you would kind of... Uh, fictionalize a few things here and there from a cinematic point of view of storytelling. But uh, more or less it's based around true events and uh, that's what we kept. Perfect. I believe you've got for the first time some stills from behind the scenes to share yeah, with I... us. Uh, would you like to... Yeah? Can we have the first one please? So he's taken me to locations like you cannot imagine, you know, and there we are doing all these scenes. So, um, so the first still was yes from Dagri Chol. It, can you go back to the first one, just for a second? The first one that you showed, the one before this. So, and this is basically the BRA gang, which is Babu, uh, Rama and Arun. And uh, I don't know why they call, and that's why they call the gang BRA. I didn't think it. They realized it's spelled out to be bra, but uh, uh, I think that's uh, basically it. Those are the three guys who basically are best friends and uh, make that gang. Can go to the next. Go to the next. This is uh, Maksud's den, and uh, basically it's an Eid sequence where everybody is kind of called, and it's very interesting. Um, in uh, when you, while I was researching it, uh, the, um, even you know people who come from um, this 
uh, lifestyle of being uh, what we call gangsters or the underworld, they have their own rules as well. And uh, one of the rules is that uh, everybody during festivals, okay, meets as friends and sees if there can be a compromise or if there can be kind of, you know, any kind of negotiation. And they meet absolutely uh, like that. They look after each other, wish each other, and then they leave, and as soon as they leave, they are enemies again, sworn enemies. But, uh, and the second rule is that they don't attack anybody who is uh, your kin, like your blood relation, you know? So they don't attack family members of gangsters. They'll attack everybody else, but they won't do that. So it's kind of a reference of all of that. I mean, a lot of this stuff was is actually far more researched than, um, I would say like a standard film, uh, the research is kind of insane on this project. I'll take you through some of it, even in terms of clothing. I mean, I grew up in the city, so I feel a lot of the films that have been made in uh, Mumbai or Bombay have not been made by people who've grown up here. I've grown up in seeing these things, seeing these spaces, and I, I feel somewhat that I've always felt the detail missing. It always feels very generic, the gangsters, and actually they're not generic. If you come, you're a gangster that comes from Lalbagh, you have a certain style. If you're a gangster, you come from Dongri, you have another style, and another way of speaking, and another way of hanging out, and the way you wear your glasses is different. And I think that's the kind of level of detailing we got into in this film, you know, so that when you're in that world, you're actually absorbed into the atmosphere of the time. It's not just like, Achha, everyone's a gangster. Each guy has his own form, in a way. And you will kind of see that through the pictures. Go to the next one. Next one, please. So this is uh, my love interest in the film, uh, uh, okay, who's uh, playing Asha Gauli. Her name is Aishwarya Ramesh. She's a wonderful actor from uh, down south, um, uh, from uh, Chennai. And she's done a fantastic, fantastic job in the film. Um, her growth and her thing and actually Asha Gauli herself is a very very fascinating character you know she's gone through so much and has held the whole family together because um, you know he was never there he was hardly ever there he was hardly around and uh, so she plays a very very pivotal part uh, in this film and um, um, I think one thing which was interesting about Aishwarya casting her, very non-typical casting of course, because again I come, like I said, from a more independent space, we could have always cast a more glamorous, you know, more, you know, familiar face. But what I think, and that's the kind of thing that I think Arjun was really backing on this project, which I have to say was, was something which really gave me some kind of commitment as a director, because you, you basically say that let's go with someone who looks like Asha Gauli, not someone who becomes, who looks completely different, who has no relationship. And what's, uh, for me, a great, uh, for us, a great sense of praise was the family themselves, the daughters themselves, and Asha Gauli herself saying, wow, she looks a lot like me. She looks almost exactly like me when, when I was younger. And all the salwars and all that stuff, all of those things have actually been taken out of uh, Asha Gauli's own family albums. We just replicated the style. So, you know, there's a sense of authenticity with this. Uh, like, I mean, he would get, uh, uh, we, I think we blew up some 18 washing machines, you know, because he wanted the clothes to age on a certain level. And then he says, but it doesn't look right, it doesn't look right. And he said, what have you been doing? I said, Oshim, take it easy, you know, you've blown up 18 washing machines. So he said, but why are they washing it in washing machines? At that time, there were no washing machines. You have to wash it with your hands. So <laughs> the whole costume department had to go back and wash those clothes with their hands and get that kind of aging. And that's the level of detailing Oshim works at, on. And he will not shoot if the shirt isn't right, you know. So you'd be standing on set he would just not shoot it. So did you, he gets it exactly the texture and everything that he needs. And I think that is painful when you're going through it, uh, especially when you become a producer on the film. But, uh, <laughs> but I think when you see it in the end, and the end result, you know, you don't want to have it in any other way. That shirt's a character in itself. Yeah, those shirts are amazing. I want all those shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they all been stitched actually from the time. None of these things are available, you know, and the girls we had on this were amazing. They were going to small towns and getting fabric that they don't print anymore so that they could make these clothes. So a lot of that, and I think one of the things, just coming back to the shirt thing, I've always had a big problem with when I watch a Bollywood movie is that why is the star wearing the thing that looks like it was just made and all the extras look like they're sweating, you know? I always had a big problem with this. I, like, if everyone's a gangster, everyone's in the same space. 
And that's something I told Arjun. I said that, you know, we have to be in the same space. Otherwise, you're always going to look like you're standing above all the other characters that are in the room. And that was a big problem. So I think that's something, you know, these are the kinds of things that we were really on in terms of the style of the film. So you're immersed in it. He becomes the character. You don't think, oh, it's Arjun, it's Arjun throughout the film. You, you lose yourself in the film. I want to make a point on that, Arjun. Exactly what he's talking about, usually the work that you do, you do are made to stand apart. You're the star. You are sort of at the center. And here somehow, how is that process to sort of not just adopt the character, but become a part of the entire set? You know, I try to do that with every film. I mean, you try to do it, you know. Uh, the level of, uh, here you're playing a character who, you know, is alive, you know, and he, uh, you have to kind of look like him, you know, there has to be a resemblance, you're playing somebody. So that becomes different. Otherwise, you're usually playing a character who you, who's fictitious completely and you don't know. So you try to imbibe whatever those qualities are and of course then that level of detailing is not really that much until unless that character is very, very well defined. Uh, you try to do it with every film, but as I said, not everybody goes through that level or that effort to make it happen. I think the first challenge for uh, Daddy was, will I be able to look like Arun Gauli? Yeah. You know, and I think uh, uh, before we even committed to each other, we did a look test. And uh, we put some prosthetics on and, you know, we kind of worked towards it. And when we saw it and we just shot it on an iPhone, we were like, wow, you know, this just like came alive. And that's what became really, really exciting. So that was the first level of encouragement you got. And then to live up to it, you know, by creating, uh, by casting the rest of the uh, film, by creating that world and being able to just blend in became the key. So we got these amazing makeup uh, artists from Italy, okay, Sergio, uh, Simone and Ariana, they all came down from Italy. They spent, I think, four months here with us, you know, working on it. You know, we had Jess uh, Lee, who did the cinematography, who was a DOP from uh, Canada, who came down, you know, and she was a girl uh, who was uh, shooting a gangster film, you know, and that was, uh, uh, yeah, so we can go ahead yeah, with those pictures. Yeah. Yeah, just some more stuff uh, of the period of the time, Ramanak, Arun Gauli. So the film goes from the 60s and goes all the way till today. And so that's kind of the 70s. Yeah, just, just some stuff, the kind of stuff that you can't shoot in a real chawl, basically. Things exploding and, you know, like fun stuff. Yeah. Maruti, it's very difficult to get Maruti vans like that. I think we blew yeah, up the last shocking. Thing. You can't find a Maruti van when you need one, you know, to <laughs> shoot. <laughs> Go forward, I think. Uh, this was actually a good example. I just wanted to show you the kind of locations we're shooting in. Uh, that's in uh, Kamatipura. It's the back of a, a sweatshop, illegal sweatshop, actually run by real gangsters. So it was quite strange because we were shooting this gangster movie and then we had real gangsters landing up on set threatening us. So that was a whole other level that we had reached in production, I think. If you go to the next shot, actually, the next image, you'll see, um, I think, no, sorry, it's not in the right order, but okay. Oh, you can go forward. Eh? That's Nishikant Kamath who's playing... Uh, go back, go back. Uh, ...who's playing the investigating officer, uh, Vijaykar, in the film, who has a bone to pick with Gauli, and uh, whoever knows Gauli's stories knows that, you know, he didn't have a... He had this one guy who kept going after him. And he's also aging through the film. So we had to keep track of everybody's ages, you know, like they were 30 years old, they're 60 years old, you're shooting out of sequence, you're shooting with prosthetics in the middle of Kamathipura, 12 hours in the heat. Not an easy film to make, you know. Yeah. yeah. Go to the next one. This is when we came into the 80s. Go back, go back. So this is just, yeah, this is just, again, more images from the time, from the period, shooting again on real locations. Um, you know, just getting a lot of the texture of the city into the film. Uh, then there's a bunch of stuff that's behind the scenes. You can just go forward. 
uh, this character plays Hilda, who's one of the girls that actually ends up, you know, in the story, ends up betraying Rama Nayak. Oh, I, I didn't have to tell you that. I can't. Okay, sorry. But she does it in a very interesting way. Okay. Okay, this is uh, some interesting stuff behind the scene in terms of, in terms of uh, just locations where we're shooting, all the docks, smuggling stuff in the rain. Uh, quite crazy. Let me go forward. Okay, they're, a bit, they're a bit in the wrong order, but I guess we could just... So this is basically just the vibe of the film. You see the lighting, the difference, you know, in era and periods and... Arjun, that was a great producer moment, 30 seconds back. You know, actually, I'm just looking at all these stills and I'm just thinking, how the hell am I going to work in another movie? Yeah, really, I mean, I've really actually been spoiled, uh, you know, because you kind of get to do what you want to do and do it in a really, really amazing manner, you know, where you really actually, Ocean being the purest that he is, and me having to don my, you know, uh, producer hat at the same time, the actor, and at the same time think about the audience, who we are making the film for because finally you don't make a film to just watch it on your own and you want you you know to connect with the audience you want the people from Dagri Chol to the people in Punjab to connect with this movie and uh, you know so to have that kind of clarity and I think the combination worked really really well and uh, when you see stuff like this you're like damn will I ever get an opportunity to work on a film which has this kind of matter which has this kind of styling which has this kind you know, layering, and so many complex characters, such uh, great storytelling that goes back and forth, you know, and uh, and has got a thriller vibe to it. I mean, the film won't be more than two or five minutes long, you know, and to pack everything into that, you know, and at the same time make it extremely accessible to everybody was, I think, the biggest challenge. And I think we kind of have achieved that, that we'll only know once the film releases. But um, the process and get this, like you just see these images, you know, you, you don't see these kind of images, every image, and this is just normal stills being shot on uh, uh, while the film, filming's happening, you know, and while me, myself, watching it, I get surprised, so I'm sure uh, it would be something unique for people to see. Ashim, I'm not surprised at the authenticity, I mean, even in Miss Lovely, it's just something that, you know, sorry, but we expected and were thrilled to see it. But in terms of treatment, Miss Lovely was still an independent film and it was made for, you know, it premiered at Cannes and went on to win however many festivals, awards, national awards. This is a big film. So how do you keep the authenticity of your writing and your characters and yet tell a film that is not just talking to the Dagri Chol or the people who know of Arun Gauli but internationally can actually understand where you're coming from? I think that's to me like what's really an exciting thing about this film. It's really exciting for me. You know, I've always had, I've always been kind of in a way cushioned by that international thing. I can always make films for a certain kind of international audience because I come from that space. For me, what was exciting here is can I make a movie about a folk hero that, you know, people that live in Dagri Chol or, or, or just the working class that think of Gauli as a folk hero, can they watch that? Can somebody at can watch it? Can somebody, you know, like that would be truly amazing. That would be truly exciting. That it can cut across all those lines that we're not dumbing it down. And at the same time, it's super, it's super accessible. And then if somebody wants to watch it who's more nuanced, they're watching all the layers, they're seeing the layers. Somebody else may not be seeing it. That, I think we both really wanted a film like that, that, that would not, that would stay true to the story and to the space and not just suddenly, and I think that's one of the issues, frankly, I'll be blunt, that I had with the first set of producers when we came on. I, I mean, the first thing I told Arjun is like, man, we can't do like an item number here suddenly in the middle of this. Like, it's just, it's just wrong. It's not, it's not correct for this film. And if I wanted to do that kind of stuff, I would have done it when I was 20 years old. I'd be already directing like 50 films like that. That was not the idea. The idea was it was true to this, and you have the real material. You have a guy who's willing to give you his story. That he's able to call himself Arun Gauli in the movie, why would you try and make it generic, you know? So that's really where I was coming from with this. Yeah. Do we have more? I think, I think we got that combination right, you know? I think the whole, every time you go out there to make a film is you want to make a film, A, with a sensibility which you are not going to, when you watch the film, you know, cringe. Mm -hmm. A lot of films I've done where I cringe and I'm like, oh damn, why did I do that, you know? Um, and now, at least with the opportunities that you get in life, 
you can, you know, say, okay, do this, do less work, but do the right work, and you know, work with the right people. But at the same time, there's a responsibility. A film is not about, as I said, for a film which is to be indulgent and made only for me to watch and on, at home and say, look at this, how I worked on this, and harp about it. The film is expect you're expecting an audience to come there, pay for it and you know walk out of there feeling something you know taking something back and you have to give back and so you have to be very very clear about that what happens mostly when we do international films or films for festivals you know they become very ambiguous you know they become very you know indulgent in many ways we this did not give us that luxury because a when you want to make a film like that you could do it but you have to shoot it in a room but when you make a film of this scale, you know, you have a responsibility and a film which is true to an audience that is huge, that goes to, uh, which Arun Gauli has his own following, who are going to come there, you have to be true to them. You have to be true to yourself. You have to be true to the budget, you know. And you got to kind of think about all those things, put them into perspective and say, are we, being indulgent at this point in time, then we should pull the reins, you know, and when we need to really go for it, do it. What's important in this whole combination was A, the vibe, the world, and I think that Oshim is created beautifully with the kind of people, the team, everybody who came on to the film. He was so responsible in bringing so many of those people onto the film who we worked with, you know, and my job was always to make sure that we are not disconnecting from the audience, you know, that if I can't understand it, or I don't know why you're taking this shot, or don't, don't do it, you know, because I don't know what's going to happen. And Oshim is very, very different in the way he takes his shots. You, this film doesn't have one OS. I've never, like, an over-shoulder uh, shot of a close-up of another guy while talking. You know, I could be sitting here, talking here, and then the next shot's going out there, but then the way it's cut and it comes together, in fact, Deepa, who's our editor, um, first when she saw the footage, she's like, God, how am I going to cut this? And now uh, it took her two months to just figure out what he was planning and how he was trying to tell the story. I could see it, but, you know, for her to also get into the groove of it and for it to be seamless, okay, it takes time. So when you're trying to do something new and different, but at the same time, making sure you're not alienating anybody was actually a combination that we wanted to get. And uh, hopefully we've achieved that. That's what was the key. I think achieving that uh, combination as a director and with that vision, with this subject, was, uh, like you said, a daunting task, but also a beautiful challenge that you've adapted to. But I want to know, as a producer of something like this, I mean, we hear day in and out that independent films are not, this is not independent, but it's not something with a big banner backing you and, you know, you have the whole plan. Did you have a plan on day one? Did you...? It's my banner. It will be a big banner soon. It is Kundalini <laughs> Pictures. It's a big <laughs> banner. It's beautiful. No, no, uh, but did you have a plan on day one of the life or the journey of this film? You know, I said, I want to make this movie. Mm. I want to make it with Oshim. There's nobody else I'm going to make this film with. Uh, if he had said no, I wouldn't have made the film. Mm. And. Um, all the people, as I said earlier, in the beginning of our journey, had left us. There were a lot of people who had worked a lot, you know, a long time, and had stuck with us, and had not got paid. And uh, there was a responsibility towards that. Of course, there was also a kind of an obsession about making the film myself. And so I said, okay, whatever it is, we'll start the movie. You know, we will do it. We'll see how it goes. Okay, and we'll run with it. And uh, I mean, I'm grateful to the whole team to have been that committed around it. So yes, it was done in a very independent manner because there was no studio backing, okay? It was not an indie film because it doesn't have the scale of that, okay? But we are trying to shoot it in a thing. So I don't think anybody's really done that. Uh, you know, it was just, your passion that drove this film, and uh, I'm glad it did, because it ended up being extremely enriching, and is something which I think I've learned so much about production, you know, about how 
uh, what goes into making a film if you really want to make it correctly. And I think created wonderful relationships through the process of doing that. I know the kind of people I would definitely be using in my films going forward and how we would be going forward with that. And a lot of people who I will never work with, you know, at the same time because it just, they just cannot get it. They don't want, they're not passionate enough. So I would only work, what this film has taught me is to work with people who are only passionate. And uh, then commercially what it does and what happens, that we will see uh, when the film comes out. Uh, I can't believe that, Oshim, you've made the next film. We can move on. That's, that's Lee being funny. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some stills in here which have been slipped in quietly. Uh, just go back for a minute. Uh, and one more back. So this is the set we built, the Nagri Chol set. Uh, you can see it, you know, at night as well. So we spent a lot of time on the set. Um, also, uh, I was very particular about the kinds of light, you know, there, there was a certain type of sodium light at a certain point in, in Bombay growing up and then it changed to tubes at a certain point. So a lot of the films also color coded like that, so you know the eras without having to resort to cheap like CPR toning and all that kind of stuff. It actually is the way the light works in the film, so just go forward. Keep going, yeah, it's just a night, you can go forward. Okay, so we can talk a little bit about Arjun. No, we shouldn't talk about this one. Yeah, some of this is actually from the film itself. Maybe we shouldn't talk about it yet. Um, yeah, this too. Yeah, so this image, like, I mean, Go this back. is uh, a crazy image. And uh, Oshim, I remember, told me, uh, you know, uh, while we were uh, sitting one day and we was uh, working on the script together, that I have this image in my head about, you know, him having his child and a gun in the hand at the same time. And I said, Oshim, that's really filmy, yeah. you know what I mean? And it, uh, you know, it, it, it can be like, you know, a gun and the gangster with the baby and all of that. But he said, no, 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 you don't understand it. I have a different way of seeing it. And how this scene actually happens and what the mood of the scene is and where he's placed this. Uh, when you all watch the film, uh, please, you will remember, okay, this conversation, it's so, it's so apt and it so beautifully comes in, you know, and it's so poignant or the story, the way it moves forward. Um, uh, but you have to watch the film. Uh, so these imageries are, imageries are very, very strong. You don't see stuff like that, you know. And I, I also like the idea, like, what happens, right, when a gangster is, and no gangster, very few gangster movies deal with this. What happens when you're in the midst of a gang war and you have a child? Like, it's an amazingly dramatic thing. And you, we, no, no gangster movie deals with that. Like, just dealing with a family on an everyday basis is dramatic enough, right? So I'm saying, like, what happens when you're actually also fighting a battle and suddenly you, you have a child and you have to deal with the domestic and you have to deal with this outside world? It's, it's something else entirely. It takes it to a different level, I think, you know. Um, we can go forward. These are just some of the images from... Uh, is that That's it? That's it, I think. Okay, I think we can jump, jump forward a bit. Uh, I think this repeats... Oh, yeah, that's Jess. Uh, we yeah, talk about this a little bit. Actually, this is a film that had two DOPs on it. Jess shot most of it, but because we shot over three schedules, uh, quite challenging actually for a director to have two DOPs, especially with such a strong style. Uh, I developed a lot of that style with Jess, who's a French-Canadian. Um, it was also a very big film for her. She's come from a much more indie space. Uh, and Pankaj Kumar was the second uh, who just shot Rangoon and he shot Ship of Thieves, a lot of films. Um, and who he was the second DOP who worked on it. So that's also amazing because when you look at the film now, it's, it's really seamless. You know, you see some more. So I think there's some repeats here. Forward. Go on, that's, yeah, go forward, please. That's Pankaj shooting now. So some of it is shot by him there. Go forward. Talk about this. Again, situation where you're shooting in real locations. Locations are incredible. I, I didn't even know they existed. You know, they're like people living, and they haven't changed in over years. You know, the people who are tailoring out there. You see a lot of Nike stuff come out of there, and a lot of Adidas coming out of there. Okay, <laughs> and all that's going on in the background. And there's a lot of embroidery, beautiful embroidery that goes towards to, uh, to France and to all these places. And in fact, Rama, who's one of our uh, thing, 
uh, he uh, one day we were, we were shooting on this day and there was this uh, charpai and they put the weave on it and you know they kind of do the embroidery on that charpai uh, they've got the net and then they do the embroidery on it and on that they put a chandar so it doesn't get spoiled and Rama thought it's a bed and he went and he sat on it and he went through this embroidery this guy had spent I think four months okay doing embroidery on and he went bang right through that thing and I've never seen yeah. a guy look so distraught yeah. <laughs> but the, the karigar who was there I mean he just held his head he said char mahine char mahine the char mahine ke kaam ka apne yeah. kya kar diya and, and, and this is gangster paradise yeah? yeah so you don't even want to mess with these guys you don't want to rip anyone's embroidery in a place like that no 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 and actually we did end up having to deal with the repercussion of it quite badly at the end of the oh, but we will get into that some other time i think um i think this is all very exciting it looks great next steps i mean we're waiting to see it do we have dates do we have a release so yeah i mean i think um, one is definitely uh, a to take it to um, you know uh, can and that's where uh, uh, hopefully we will go first and then um, uh, after that, uh, it's such a jumble of dates, there's so many films we made, you know, so you guys kind of have to find the right date. But I think we will, you will see the film in July, that's what looks very realistic right now. Uh, I think by mid-July we should be, uh, uh, we'll give you a date in about a week or two, but I think by mid-July we should be ready to come. So are you planning, and of course, I mean, I'm not surprised if we are going to see this in Cannes, because, you know, I think all of your films have uh, the last two been there as well, right? No, not Only Miss Lovely. John and Jane was Berlin. Uh, yeah. John, John and Jane was at Berlin. Berlin yeah. yeah. Um, so, do you ever feel that, you know, once you're opening up the film over there or showcasing it there, uh, there's a certain sort of slot that the film gets in when you come here to do a theatrical release or is this also going to be the first time when you're going to... Well, it's a film it? which I, I, we've been talking about. It's a film which I think is compatible to both, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I think that is what we went out to make. So yes, we're not going to be uh, apologetic about it and say, oh, this is a film that goes to Cannes, so it's going to be this kind of a film, or be, you know, pseudo about it. But uh, and at the same time, we're not going to be saying that uh, this is a film which is a story of a guy who comes from grassroots of India. You know, this is a story of that man. We're telling that man that story in the most, you know, uh, truest way that we can. Um, the teaser that which we, you've seen, okay, has got the kind of reaction which I think kind of uh, puts the faith into us that what we went out to do was the right thing. When your driver comes up to you and says, that's okay, you know, and then you have, you know, um, um, intellect who you think you know from the industry or whatever who will say wow i have never seen something like this in this genre you know this is very very unique so you have both aspects of society kind of there and that's what we want we don't want to make any rules or boundaries for a film and i don't think any film should have any rules or boundaries to uh, we have about 10 minutes, so we're going to open up for questions. Can you please introduce yourself, sir? I am Jyoti Venkatesh. I know Singhal. Jyoti, how are you? Uh, you know, when you decided to produce a film, uh, did you make it a point to see Dagadi Chawl in Marathi, where Makran Deshpande had played the same role? And number two, were you also a little bit scared about the uh, political repercussions and the censor backlash that the film may get when it is shown to censor board. Uh, yeah, oh my god, now you made me think about all of these things. <laughs> uh, but um, initially, yeah, I mean, the first thing is that, uh, you know, you think that this is going to be a film which could run itself into a lot of controversies. And before we even started filming in it, we got into quite a bit of trouble. Um, uh, which we're still dealing with, you know, it's not something that's going to go away. But um, I think we've got a tremendous amount of support and, we, and I must say this, 
from our uh, Mumbai police. Our Mumbai police really, really supported this movie. You know, they uh, did not uh, say, oh, this is an Arun Gawli story and we won't let you shoot, especially when you're shooting on real locations, you know, where you're going into all of that, where a lot of that could be disrupted. So I think it was really amazing and it was very surprising how, and we are very grateful to them for the kind of liberty they gave us to make the film. Uh, what was your other question? Sorry? Uh, whether you saw uh, Dagdi Chol, the original Marathi. Yeah, so Ma Dagdi I saw, I saw, I haven't seen the film, but uh, I uh, knew that they had made this movie and Makran looked very much like him uh, in the film as well. Uh, but uh, the people who saw the film knew that it was not a biopic, it was a film that was a love story based inside of Dagri Chol. So uh, that was the difference. But what was encouraging from it um, was that that film was made, I think, in a budget. Uh, a friend of mine produced it, Sachin Ahir, who again uh, is actually Arun Gavli's nephew. And uh, he made the film in, I think, two and a half crores, and that film ended up doing 22 crores in uh, the regional thing. So, Hopefully, I get some of that audience back into the theatres. <laughs> so that was a good kind of a barometer uh, of the kind of popularity Arun Gavli has. And um, the third question was? Censor uh, repercussions and the sensors. political pressure. But you have the permission from the family, so there is no tension. In no, that's that. fine. We've got the rights. We've got, you know, it's all uh, done on that level. We've got their blessings and their support. But uh, from a censorship point of view, I don't know, man. They never cease to surprise you. So once we reach that level of getting the film censored, we'll figure out what's going to happen. And a big compliment to Arshim and Arjun, the actor, because I couldn't believe that it is the same Arjun Rampal who is in front of us as daddy. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Jyoti. See, after what happened with uh, Leela Bansali on the sets, you know, and you guys are handling a very incendiary topic, and you had the right, uh, guts to ask the family for the rights, you know, and, and you, thankfully you got it. But my question is that, and this person is still alive, going back and forth between jail. Now, did you, or have you encountered, or did you think, you know, that you may, the, handling an issue where you could have probably just not taken those permissions from the family because because uh, this gentleman is alive and he's a gangster. He could say, I mujhe this depiction chahiye mera. Nahi to tumhari picture nahi chalegi. So did, did you anticipate those kind of reactions and take some actions around it? Yeah, so it, I mean, it wasn't easy to convince a, you know, uh, the family because it is very sensitive. You know, you're going to go into his past, you're going to dig in there, you know, and uh, these are, yeah, you don't know, you know, he's scared legally what implications it can have on him. And therefore, um, we have to be, you know, very clear about how the film progresses. So you take incidents that is in public domain, you know, which people are aware about. Of course, a little more from the family, from a research point of view, okay, which is how they, uh, how he really is, you know, how people uh, look at him. And one thing we mustn't forget is, why is this film called Daddy? Because that's the nickname that's been given to Arun Gauli by his people. He's not a bhai. He's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, a don or a thing. They call him Daddy. That means he has a heart somewhere which he has touched a lot of people's lives. And I think that's the human side of his story also, which was what we got from the family. The incidents that have happened, which is in public domain, okay, are in public domain, okay. The way we have, uh, the structure of the film is in such a manner that it is from people's point of views. So it's not him saying, oh, I did this. You know, it's hello? a character's point of view. Yes, hello. Hello, I, hello sir. Yes. Sir, I'm Ramesh Rao from Film Bazaar magazine. I was in that area. I was in my house. I was in my house. ये पंद्रह बीस साल पहले की स्टोरी है करेक्ट सर ओशन जी तो जब भी कुछ किसको डेथ हो जाता किसको शूट आउट हो जाता मेरे एक बिल्डिंग के सामने से उनको लेके जाया जाता था जय राम श्री राम बोल के हम लोग छोटे थे देखते थे सब शूट आउट तो क्या इनको मेरे क्लास में एक लड़का था वो बोलता था यार वो दड़की दगड़ी चाल में रहता था उनको सोने नहीं मिलता था इतना शूट आउट होता था 
वो सवेरे स्कूल आके बोलता था तो ऐसा कुछ सीन आपने किया है क्या जहाँ झगड़ी चाल में शूट आउट होते हैं और कोई वहाँ के जो लोग रहते हैं उनको भी लेके आपने कुछ किया है ऐसा हाँ उन लोगों के साथ उन लोगों के साथ पहली बात तो आपको मिलना पड़ता है जो वहाँ पर रहे हैं वो जो उस पीरियड के पार्ट थे यू नो जिनका वहाँ पर एक्सपीरियंस रहा है तो उन लोगों से हमारी बातचीत हुई थी उन्होंने कहा है कि कितना डेंजरस था वो पीरियड यू नो जब गैंग बॉस हुआ करते थे और ये नाइन्टीज़ लेट एटीज़ और मिड नाइन्टीज़ तक जो पीरियड था वो वो मुंबई और वेरी वेरी स्केरी पीरियड यू नो बिकॉज इट वॉज़ वेरी वेरी अंडर वर्ल्ड ड्रिवन अभी काफ़ी सफाई हो गई है यू नो सब अभी बोलते कि अभी अब तो वाइट कॉलर बन गए भाई यू नो वो काम नहीं करते तो आई थिंक एवरीबडी मगर वैसे क्यों बने वैसे वो उन्होंने क्यों किया क्योंकि दिस थिंग इज वॉट इज़ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इज वट पीपल शुड अंडरस्टैंड इज कि द मिल्स जो थे ना वहाँ के दगड़ी चौल वॉज मिल वर्कर के घर थे वहाँ पर जब मिल स्ट्राइक पर गए वेन द स्ट्राइक हैपन दे लॉट ऑफ पीपल गॉट अनएम्प्लॉयड लॉट ऑफ पीपल डिन नो वट टू डू एंड द यूनियंस क्रिएटेड दैट एंड दैट्स वॉट क्रिएटेड द अंडर पैली ऑफ द अंडर वर्ल्ड इन मुंबई तो अगर हम किसी को काम दें किसी को यू नो उनकी रोजी रोटी आ रही है घर पर तो वो बंदूक क्यों उठाएगा वो बंदूक तभी उठाएगा जब ही हैज़ टू सर्वाइव फॉर हम सेल्फ तो आई थिंक विदाउट जस्टिफाइंग टू मच और फिर एक होता है कि चस्का लग जाता है पावर का जब आप पावरफुल हो जाते हो और सब आपकी सुनते हैं तो वो भी एक नशा है और उस तरीके से फिर किस तरीके से यू नो वो बढ़ते रहते हैं पैसा का नशा आ जाता है जब आप यू you नो know, पैसे कमाने लगते हो और आसानी से आप बिल्डर को फ़ोन कर रहे हो बोल रहे हो कि बॉस प्रोटेक्शन चाहिए तो उतने पैसे दे दे यू नो तो वो जो पीरियड है वो सब तो दिखाया क्योंकि दैट्स ट्रू टू द पीरियड हाई आई एम गीतिका आई टीच टी वी प्रोडक्शन एंड टी वी एंटरटेनमेंट इन एम ई डी यूनिवर्सिटी मुंबई सो माई क्वेश्चन इज देर आर टू टाइप्स ऑफ ऑडियंस वन इज पी वी आर का क्राउड एंड अनदर इज गेटी गैलेक्सी का क्राउड तो आपको क्या लगता है ये दोनों टाइप का क्राउड होल्ड कर पाएंगे आप I, 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 for us, I think the success would be if it can cut across different kinds of audiences. And I think, for me, the hope is quite ambitious that, like, maybe we can think of a different kind of Hindi film. Like, everything doesn't have to be either it's PVR or it's festival or it's you know like a big uh, uh, 500 crore film and that has a different aesthetic. Like, why do we think in such simple terms? Like, why can't there be more overlap? Like there is in other industries where we have. something which looks beautiful and is still really big or something that's very intense and it's still very commercial i'm saying why are we stuck to these old categories i think it's time to start moving on and start creating you know more spaces for what hindi film can do that's that's my hope we have seen different films like once upon a time in mumbai so kangana ranaut was very glamorous and your asha gaule is very simple and sober and decent yeah. like next door girl another d company so d company was not commercially hit but once upon a time in mumbai was commercially hit because of songs and looks and so that's why i'm asking so fine <laughs> things have changed that. well so. yes and no you know like i mean if you look at the arc of the industry right now i yeah. think everybody in this room knows that there right. is no calculated guess yes. the things that we all know the, all the glamorous stuff that supposedly show fire hit complete wash out films that are really small which you don't expect anyone to watch they've done 10 times their business i think the model is changing i think we have to be no and you see oh. i mean i would also say that there are films like rang de basanti okay which kind of i think is a good example to give where it went to two different kinds of audiences and both of them understood it why because it did not alienate people हम लोग क्या करते हैं कि हम बता बोलते हैं कि अच्छा ठीक है ये पिक्चर है ये दिस इज़ द स्टार ऑफ द मूवी दिस इज़ द हिरोइन ऑफ द फिल्म दिस इज़ द बजट ऑफ द फिल्म पुट सो मेनी सॉन्ग्स इन टू इट यू नो वी काइंड ऑफ पैकेज आवर फिल्म्स मोस्टली एंड से दिस मूवी सो मेक इट पंजाब फ्रेंडली मेक इट यू नो 
साउथ फ्रेंडली मेक इट मुंबई फ्रेंडली यू नो यू काइंड ऑफ फेवर द सर्किट्स दैट गिव यू द मैक्सिम ऑफ कमर्शियल सक्सेस एंड यू काइंड ऑफ पुट थिंग्स इन अकॉर्डिंगली दिस फिल्म डजेंट लेंड इट सेल्फ टू दैट दिस इज अ ट्रू स्टोरी यू नो यू हैव टू बी ट्रू टू द कैरेक्टर बट एट द सेम टाइम वी कैन नॉट मेक इट रियली रियली इनएक्सेबल एंड वी ट्राई टू डू दैट पिक्चर क्या करती है बॉक्स ऑफिस पे हाउ मनी पीपल लाइक इट कितने जूते पड़ेंगे दैट यू एंड अप नोइंग ओनली ऑन दैट फ्राइडे दैट द फिल्म रिलीज ऑल राइट अर्जुन इट इज बीन सेवेंटीन ईयर्स आई वॉन्ट टू से यू आर अमेजिंग इन मोक्ष एंड दैट वॉज योर बेस्ट परफॉर्मेंस टिल डेट दैट इज योर बेस्ट परफॉर्मेंस टिल डेट आई होप कि डैडी ये जो ओपिनियन है वो चेंज कर पाए ऑल द बेस्ट थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू आई थिंक we're at the end of our time um is there any last question pressing question okay last question for the gentleman in the front can you give me a mic uh the kind of preparation you did for this role uh, i'm sure you did a lot of involvement in terms of method acting you know you try to internalize the character a lot uh were there any kind of psychological effects while playing the character and you know what you felt the most and how did you overcome that i think you should ask my family that <laughs> but uh uh you know no not really i mean you do, you can, i was very scared while playing him and uh, you know i used to keep asking oshim am i doing it right you know i hope i'm doing it right it wasn't like oh this is the character and i'm walking on to the set like that i think it kind of as you keep getting into it and as you keep saying those lines and you start you know working with the people around you uh, uh, it wasn't that oh this is the only way sometimes i would kind of go in a totally different direction and just feed off people and um, i think the atmosphere is created for an actor to go there you know sit what he's wearing you know all of that it just kind of brings that uh, and helps you get into it because the minute they would say cut there would be 10 people with checks behind my back to sign so <laughs> you know i mean so th- th- i mean you went through all those different kind of things but yes yeah, somewhere i think what really helped was understanding him and understanding between us about not playing this guy as the typical hero you know not projecting him like that going as close as we could and then when we got to meet him uh you know just to see that body language and to see how you know he is and he's and what was really nice and what i have what i noticed was they are very very gentle and they have wo tezi bahut hoti hain you know they are very polite they are very humble but they will say something and you will say hold on what does that mean <laughs> you know so i mean to get those little little things into the script i uh, was very exciting for us and um, psychologically i am i think i'm quite okay right now no <laughs> I don't know. I I hope I uh, don't just have... about just about. <laughs> yeah, just about. I I think on the edge. Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of people didn't mess with me. That was I know very another interesting thing had happened and uh, which I'd like to share with everybody. I was one day dressed like him and I was in Dagri Chowk as we were doing some shoot there. And his brother-in-law okay walked up and came and touched my feet because he thought i was him and i thought that for me was like the biggest thing that could happen you know i i mean that was really really incredible uh, so uh, yeah it was it was really something special and let's hope it's as special as we are making it out to be when you all see it i think uh, it does look special it is very special and i think I personally feel it's going to do something that has never happened before. It's going to cross all these boundaries of mainstream independent festival. It's just, you know, going to be something that everyone can come and see like you said in different layers. And uh 
I want to thank you both for coming here, sharing with us this first look, the story behind Daddy, the magic of Daddy, and uh, for putting yourselves through what seems like an artist task, but I think it's going to be amazing. So all of you, thank be you. ready for next steps. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming here. Thank you, Arjun. Well, thank thank you, you all. Thanks for coming, and really, uh, it was really fun. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We're beginning right away with a valedictory by one of the most respected and celebrated minds in the business of m &E. A big round of applause for Ashim and Arjun. Thank you, Ashim and Arjun. Thank you. That was lovely.